Was Onicha captured in the Nigerian Biafra Civil War? Yes or no? Just watch this video and subscribe to our channel, Online Chief I Priest. I can't say for certain what Lagos has got. Um, when we lost direct contact with Lagos, they had some four battalions ill-equipped and um, I know that they have been purchasing a lot of arms since and I know that they have negotiated and received a few armored vehicles. Prior to that they had some scout cars I know they have tried to get planes. I am not sure they have got them there. But on our side, we too have not been sitting quietly. There has been quite a lot of build up. And I think what I have here is sufficient to maintain the integrity of Biafra and more. When it became clear that the problems between the northern region and the eastern region were not going to be solved by negotiations, the eastern region succeeded from Nigeria in May 1967 and declared itself the Independent Republic of Biafra. Gowon countered by ordering his troops to retake the eastern region in a police action. The police action turned into a full-blown war when the Biafrans made a lightning invasion of the Midwest region which caught the Federal Army off guard and shook it out of its complacency. The Midwest invasion was a disastrous political miscalculation by Biafra which dissipated sympathy for it in the western and Midwest region. It also gave some non-Eastern Nigerians the impression that Biafra's objectives were not limited to self-defense, but it had also ambitions for territorial expansions. Mutala, through his own civilian contacts, independently took steps to procure weapons for the impending war. In rumor rife Nigeria, this led to unfounded rumors that the weapons were to be used by Mutala to overthrow Gowan. Mutala was appointed GOC of the hastily formed 2nd Division of the Army and had the task of evicting the Biafrans from the Midwest. Mutala literally built two divisions from scratch. He commanded all available vehicles, including those supposed to be used for other divisions for other purposes, and men he could lay his hands on to form his new division. Among the men drafted into Mutala's division was an up-and-coming Lieutenant Colonel named Alani Akinrinadi. Mutala's forceful persona also allowed him to poach men from other divisions such as Captain Rimawa and Lieutenant Mohamed Mayaki of the 1st Division who had been sent to Lagos to collect vehicles for their own division but were instead drafted by Mutala along with the vehicles they had procured for the 1st Division. Lieutenant Shehu Musayaradua of the 3rd Division was also commanded by Mutala when he travelled to Lagos on an errand for his divisional commander Colonel Benjamin with Adekunli. Other officers in Mutala's division that would later rise to prominence included Sani Abacha and Lieutenants Chris Ali and Ola Ogumekon, both of the 7th Infantry Brigade. Mutala's newly assembled 2nd Division drove the Biafrans out of the Midwest region in a blistering counter offensive. For the sake of historical accuracy, it should be pointed out that the speed and success of the counter-attack was due as much to Mutala's purposeful energy as it was to the disorganization of the enemy. Once the Biafran forces in the Midwest had been overrun, members of the 2nd Division carried out a terrible massacre of civilians so grotesque that Gowon had to apologize for it decades after the end of the Nigerian Civil War. As punishment for their sympathy for the Biafrans, Hundreds of Ibu civilians in the Midwest were summarily executed by soldiers belonging to the 2nd Division. One of the officers who served under him, then Lieutenant Ishola Williams, 
alleged that Mutala ordered the summary execution of Biafran prisoners of war. In an episode typical of his unpredictable nature, although his troops had killed hundreds of innocent civilians, Mutala personally saw to it that the mother of Major Nzogu was protected and not harmed. After recapturing the Midwest, Mutala installed Major Samuel Obemudia as his new military governor without seeking or obtaining Gowon's approval for the appointment. Nonetheless, Ogbemudia remained in that post for a further eight years until he was removed by Mutala. Buoyed by his Midwest success, Mutala's next target was the strategically important Biafran city of Onicha. Mutala's attack plan for Onicha changed dramatically when Biafran troops blew up the Niger Bridge as Mutala was at the bridge's entrance considering driving across it. The second division could now either attack Onicha via A, a dangerous and direct assault via a river crossing, or B, by crossing the Niger River unopposed via territory held by the neighboring 1st Division, then proceeding overland to Onicha. Realizing the dangers and complexities of a direct river based assault on Onicha, Army Headquarters advised Mutala to choose option B. However, Mutala was unwilling to advance through territory held by 1st Division, as he did not want to cooperate with his former classmates at Barewa College and Sandhurst, Lieutenant Colonel Shua. Shua was the commander of 1st Division, and although he and Mutala had known each other since childhood and enlisted in the army on the same day, they frequently clashed. Mutala decided to proceed with the dangerous river crossing, disregarding the advice of the army headquarters and instructions not to proceed from his Sanos cosmates Ilya Bisala and Hassan Kassina. Lieutenant Colonel Frank Asidia, one of Mutala's brigade commanders, urged him to reconsider. Asidia considered a river crossing to be suicidal and was so convinced that he was doomed to fail that he requested time to write a final letter to his wife. Asidia eventually refused to take part in the crossing. Mutala was unmoved and insisted that he would have his way. So controversial was Mutala's plan that even the commander of the neighboring 1st Division, Colonel Mohamed Shua, tried to intervene. The difference in the two men's personalities was reflected in the manner in which they commanded their respective army divisions. While Mutala's 2nd Division embarked on daring, gung-ho assaults against the enemy, often against orders from the army headquarters, Shua's 1st Division was methodical and quietly efficient. While Shua was conventional to the point of caution, Mutala was impulsive, fearless, and unorthodox to the point of chaos. He paid little or no regard to orthodox combat doctrine and did not bother to issue written operational orders, instead preferring verbal orders. He did not believe in surprising the enemy either and would announce assaults in advance by instructing his men to sound a bugle before advancing. This was part of his psychological warfare and was intended to demonstrate to the enemy that he did not fear or have respect for the ability to resist an attack, even if notified to the enemy in advance. According to his colleague, James Oluleye, Mutala also disregarded logic when he came to planning his battles and would rely on the advice of religious soothsayers to determine the most auspicious dates for executing battlefield offenses. At a meeting between Shua and Mutala to review operational aspects for the attack on Onicha, Shua urged Mutala to drop his dangerous river assault plan for Onicha, but Mutala refused and ignored the objections by army headquarters, his brigade commander Lieutenant Colonel Asidia and fellow divisional commander Colonel Shua. His exchange of views with Shua became so heated that Captain Baba Usman had to stand between Mutala and Shua as he feared they would come to blows. Mutala proceeded to attack Onisha via a river crossing even though his navigational instruments were not working. The water level was high, he had no reconnaissance and most of his troops were not soldiers with combatant commissions. These problems were compounded by the fact that many of them could not even swim. They certainly had no expertise or experience of complex amphibious assaults. Were he a citizen of any country other than Nigeria, Mutala would almost certainly have been court-martialed for disobeying orders. Mutala personally led his men during the crossing. Biafran troops led by the tough Colonel Joe Hannibal Achuzia 
repelled and routed Mutala's 1,000 strong troops and inflicted many casualties on them, some by drowning under fierce Biafran fire. Among those federal soldiers lucky enough to survive the Biafran onslaught were Lieutenants Shehu Musa Yaradua, Oladik Bodia, and Ishola Williams. Dia and Williams had just been commissioned into the army from the NDA's first regular combatant corps, and this baptism of fire was their first experience of combat. Undeterred by this setback and displaying his characteristic never say die attitude, Mutala again tried the amphibious capture of Onicha. Federal troops were again routed by the Biafrans, who shot and wounded one of Mutala's ferry captains. Water flooded into the pilot's ferry and several soldiers drowned. Others dived into the water in a panic and also drowned. Still determined to get his way and displaying a great mental strength and determination after such heavy losses, Mutala tried the ambitious river crossing for a third time and failed again. His stubborn persistence with the river crossing was reinforced by the advice of his religious soothsayers who had assured him that it would succeed. Having sustained heavy losses, the fragile discipline in 2nd Division broke down as some troops started looting and refused to contemplate any more amphibious base attacks on nature. After this third failure, Mutala swallowed his pride and agreed to execute the plan initially approved by army headquarters and finally captured Onicha. Even then, he grudgingly agreed to advance through territory held by his neighboring 1st Division without bothering to coordinate with him or inform 1st Division's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Shua, and risking an inadvertent confrontation between friendly forces. But victory came at a great price, as by this time, 2nd Division were dispirited, undisciplined, and battered after suffering heavy losses against the Biafrans including the destruction of an entire convoy of vehicles near Abagana. This occurred on March 31, 1968, after an opportunistic Biafran soldier disobeyed orders and fired the single last mortar in the procession of the Biafrans and Mutala's convoy. The plucky soldiers called a direct hit on a vehicle in the convoy carrying ammunition, which ignited. The resulting fire set the convoy of almost 100 vehicles ablaze and proved to be one of the most spectacular Biafran successes of the Nigerian Civil War. The disaster was possible because Mutalas authorized the mass movement of a large logistics and supply convoy along a narrow route on which the bulky vehicles could not turn around or reverse, and on which they were susceptible to ambush. Mutala was recalled from the front and replaced by Colonel Haruna. However, 2nd Division was so dispirited that Haruna himself was later replaced by Colonel Gibson Jalo. The discipline in 2nd Division deteriorated further with some of his soldiers looting occupied towns, harassing the wives of civilians, and fraudulently drawing the pay of dead or missing soldiers. Lieutenant Colonel Adeni Ron was court-martialed for the latter practice. Mutola's successor, Colonel Haruna, had some members of 2nd Division executed by firing squad after they carried out an armed robbery on a bank in the Midwest town of Asaba. The Onicha episode was instructive vis-à-vis -vis Mutala's positive and negative personality traits. Mutala had seemingly limitless courage, led his true by example and would often accompany his men into battle. His willingness to share the physical danger of battle endeared him to and emboldened his men. He was a natural leader, although his leadership often relied on coercion and intimidation of subordinates rather than persuasion. He was very much from the Brigadier Maimalari School of Discipline. While he was a strict disciplinarian who would not accept insubordination from others, he was often disobedient and contemptuous towards his own superiors. His colleague James Ululaye noted that Mutala was kind-hearted even as a bully. He did not tolerate opposition except to realize you outwitted him. To him, every human organization was a military machine that can be worked to death without question. He had very little respect for authority while he would not tolerate disrespect from subordinates. 
Once he decided on the course of action, there would be no going back on his decision. He also demonstrated tremendous tenacity by picking himself up and refusing to be deterred after each defeat. After leaving the second division, Mutala returned to Lagos and resumed his pre-war post of the Inspector of Signals. He was promoted to Colonel in April 1968. After the war, Mutala was promoted to Brigadier in October 1971 after taking a Staff College course at the Joint Services Staff College in England. Thanks for watching our channel at Online Chief Priest. Kindly like, share, subscribe for more updates like this. Thank you.